everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books Podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and today I'm delighted that we're joined by Mark Epstein, MD. Before we get to his formal introduction, some Banyan-related announcements. Although we have people joining us from all over the world online for these events, we acknowledge that the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Banyan Books and Sound has just completed its 50th anniversary year, 50 years as Canada's spiritual and healing resource. You can visit us in store seven days a week, or you can shop online if you go to banyan.com, that's B-A-N, yen.com. Every time you make purchases from Banyan Books, you support all kinds of wonderful programming like today's event. There's a special acknowledgement for today. We got news that Zen Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh passed away at age 95 yesterday. So we'd just like to acknowledge um, the passing of a great soul and a wonderful human being who served so many. Our guest today, Mark Epstein, MD, is a psychiatrist in private practice in New York City and the author of a number of books about the interface of Buddhism and psychotherapy. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard University. He's a contributing editor to Tricycle, the Buddhist Review. Dr. Epstein's books include Thoughts Without a Thinker, Going to Pieces Without Falling Apart, Going on Being, Open to Desire, Psychotherapy Without the Self, and The Trauma of Everyday Life. Today, Mark Epstein is with Banyan Books in conversation about his latest book, The Zen of Therapy, Uncovering a Hidden Kindness in Life. This book is a remarkable exploration of the therapeutic relationship, and Epstein reflects on one year's worth of therapy sessions with his patients to observe how his training in Western psychotherapy and his equally long investigation into Buddhism in tandem led to greater awareness for his patients and for himself. Weaving together the wisdom of two worlds, Dr. Epstein illuminates the therapy relationship as spiritual friendship and reveals how a therapist can help patients cultivate the sense that there is something magical, something wonderful, and something to trust running through our lives, no matter how fraught they have been or might become. For when we realize how readily we have misinterpreted ourselves, when we stop clinging to our falsely conceived constructs, when we touch the ground of being, we come home. To learn more about our distinguished guest today and his work, please visit his website, which is markepsteinmd.com. Dr. Epstein, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Hey, Ross. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I wish I could be there in person. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I believe c- congratulations are in order too. I understand your your new book, The Zen of Therapy, is on the cover of the New York Times book review. So, so I have, so I have been told, and I've even seen. Yes, the That's first wonderful. time the New York, the first time the New York Times has reviewed any of my books. So it, it's a, uh, it's wonderful on many levels. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm very curious about how this book took form. You titled the book, The Zen of Therapy, and you use the four seasons as a backdrop for the coming and going nature of your, your patients, much like the Zen poets used nature to uncover intuitive understandings of reality. So um, how did this, this sort of theme and structure emerge for you in the writing process? Well, the, the, the sort of unusual thing about, about me as a psychiatrist and as a therapist is that I was exposed to Buddhist practice, uh, to Vipassana meditation, to mindfulness meditation, way before I had any idea about becoming a psychotherapist, and certainly before going to medical school. 
So I immersed myself as much as I could in, in uh, the formal practice of Buddhist meditation and then in the study of Buddhist psychology. And then after a number of years of that, I needed to figure out how, how I was going to integrate that into uh, you know, an actual life and decided to go to medical school with the expressed intention of becoming a psychiatrist, wanting to be a psychotherapist. So everything I learned about Western psychotherapy, I was always looking at it through a Buddhist lens or a Buddhist prism, you know, trying to, trying to figure out how what I had already integrated into myself from my Buddhist practice, how I could use that in the practice of psychotherapy. A lot of the earlier books that I've written that you, that you mentioned at the beginning were, in my mind, attempts to translate what I understood from Buddhist psychology into the Western psychodynamically, psychoanalytically influenced language that we all speak, even if we're not Freudian, you know, but the ideas of ego and so on have, have come into general consciousness. So I wrote a number of those books, you know, trying to make Buddhism intelligible uh, from a psychological side to, to Western therapists and Western audiences in general. And the question that people kept asking me over the years, because it's been about, you know, 25 or 30 years of the, the writing those kinds of books. And in the meantime, working, you know, day to day as a therapist. So I've done all my writing just one day a week. But the question that people kept asking me it is and was, well, how do you integrate meditation, how do you integrate mindfulness, how do you integrate Buddhism into what you actually do with patients? Do you teach them to meditate? Do you meditate with them? Do you give them formal instruction? And those questions always sort of bothered me because I didn't do any of that. I, I just tried my best to be the right kind of therapist for whoever came to see me, kind of assuming that the, if the Buddhist thing had done anything for me personally, it should come through in one way or another. But I never really wanted to formalize it or to make a, you know, a workbook out of it or to start uh, promulgating mindfulness-based psychodynamic, you know, short-term psychodynamic mindfulness-based therapy. I didn't, want, I didn't want any of that. So that's all prelude to trying to answer your question. This book, I didn't know what uh, I was going to write next, and I didn't know if I was going to write a next book, but I did have this writing time set aside, this one day a week where I didn't see patients and tried to go more inside to see what would come out. So that, that question was nagging at me, you know, how do you bring Buddhism to what you do? And I decided, okay, maybe I'm old enough now to actually take this question on in a more formal way. So I decided that what I would try to do would be to isolate or, you know, write down one session, one psychotherapy session a week where something of my Buddhist whatever I knew was happening in the session, you know, one way or another. Either I might really be talking about meditation or answering a question about it, but more often than not, just I knew that some, some way I was working was, was influenced by, you know, my Buddhist background. So I set myself that task. I don't usually take a lot of notes. I usually trust the sessions to, you know, pass through time and, you know, what sticks, sticks. But um, I made myself, after, after I would pick one session, uh, in the middle of it, kind of, I would know, oh, this is the session. And then afterwards, I would scribble down the notes of what happened. And then in my writing day, I would try to write that up in a more literary kind of fashion, but not embellishing, but trying to, trying to capture just the, the quotidian, I didn't know what that word meant at first, the, the ordinary, everyday aspect of the, of the session. And I just did that religiously, you know, every, every week or so for a year, making myself do it and not, not reading the sessions over and not trying to do it with the same patient. So just, you know, I'm seeing 30 or 40 people a week. So like a mosaic or a kaleidoscopic version of therapy kind of thing. 
and I didn't look them over, but at the end of a year, I was like, okay, that's enough. And uh, I had a pile of them. And then I started to read through and I thought, oh, it's, it is sort of interesting. And I showed the uh, accumulated sessions to my editor uh, who had done my last two books with me, who I totally trust. And she liked it. She thought there was something there. And she said, but, you know, the only through line really is you because the patients are changing. So what we really need is for you to go through and reflect upon what's happened in the session, kind of show a little more about what your thinking was and give a kind of commentary or not exactly an analysis, but a, a reflection, I think, of each session. So by chance, my year of, it was face-to-face -face therapy in my office where I'm speaking from now. By chance, that year ended just before the advent of COVID-19. So it became like a record of the last year of face-to-face, -face, you know, in-person, in the office psychotherapy, which we still haven't gotten back to. And then I started writing the, the reflection which is where the real writing of the book started to take place during COVID, during the first year of, of quarantine and of isolation. Um, so that was very good for the writing because there was nothing else going on. And um, so that's where the season started to, you know, why did I, I broke the year up into the seasons, you know, fall, winter, spring, summer because I was paying so much attention to the seasons. You know, I was in the country much more uh, uh, there weren't even any cars driving around. I would go for a walk every morning. And, you know, the, the spring, that March and April in the, in the Hudson Valley, you know, every moment of spring was so alive. Summer, fall, winter, you know, goes on forever. And, uh, and then each session that I was looking at started in, it, in its, you, you know, um, the, the tiny little nature of it started to appear to me as like a, a, a haiku, a Japanese haiku or a koan, you, you know. So the, the more I went into the tiny details of it, the more I saw in each session, like each one sort of expanded. So I started um, uh, gathering books of Zen poetry and Zen koans to use as reference points in uh, trying to talk about the uh, what was going on within the psychotherapy sessions. So that that started to organize the book. That's where the, the Zen of therapy came in and the organization around the seasons. And uh, then there are about five more layers that are woven into the structure of the book that if you want to keep going on this tack, we can, we can talk about. There, there truly are so many layers. I felt like reading it w was like a, a reading meditation where I was uncovering so much within myself through that you're constantly moving back and forth between the psychotherapeutic outlook and the Buddhist meditative outlook, and then also finding the, the convergence of the two. One of the things I found really interesting was this theme. You were hesitant. You had, you ha had hesitations about bringing together your Buddhist training, psychotherapeutic training. And I think there's a lot these days where people are excited about the coming together of, of meditation and therapy. But I'm very curious about some of your hesitations around what can happen when either the therapy aspect or the Buddhist aspect gets watered down in sort of wellness communities and that kind of thing. I, I was actually hesitant about uh, writing about the convergence or talking about the convergence. I, I wasn't hesitant about bringing the two together in my own work because they. I had needed both. I needed meditation and I needed psychotherapy. And when you're trained as a psychiatrist to be a therapist, you don't really get very much training. They, you, you, you learn about the disease states and you learn about the drugs, but one day you're the therapist, you're the psychiatrist, you know, and you're in the room with the patient. All I had to draw on was my own experience in uh, looking at my own mind in meditation, and then my own experience looking at my own mind in my, in my own psychotherapy. So I was immediately pulling from both of those sides in my own work. The, the, the hesitation that I have that I think uh, maybe your question is leading to now uh, 40 years later, 
uh, mindfulness, you know, is a big deal in the psychotherapeutic communities. It's been discovered, it's been organized, it's been written about, it's been taught uh, to therapists. And a lot of younger therapists coming in want to be mindfulness-based therapists, you, you know, almost to the point of not even wanting to learn about the psychoanalytic, psychodynamic, you know, history of psychotherapy since Freud, which, although it has its problems, contains so much wisdom. So one of my agendas in this book was to show, oh, there's so much to draw on from the psychoanalytic tradition. There's so much to draw on from the Buddhist tradition. They complement each other. They help each other. You know, and they, they really can work together if the individual therapist, in this case me, you, you know, tries to bring them both out in a tactful or helpful or not in a proselytizing way. So that's one, the hesitation on, the, on that side. And then in the spiritual communities, because I've been around a lot of, you know, Buddhist centers, yoga centers, and so on, many of the spiritual teachers are really unschooled in uh, emotional, the emotional issues that we as therapists face. So that people come on retreat, they come to spiritual practice, you, you know, with all of their psychological, emotional baggage. And they, they, they look to the teachers to cure them, or they look to the practice to make all their problems go away you know, to leapfrog over doing the emotional work sometimes. So that's another cautionary note. So I'm, I'm trying to say we need all the help we can get from East and West and look at the state of our country. It's not, none of them are working very well, but uh, maybe there's hope here, you know. One of the beautiful parallels that you draw, you refer to this, this holding environment and liken it to the relationship between mother and child. And you kind of, you, you show how that is the relationship between therapist and, and patient, as well as the meditator and everything that's arising in their experience. Can you talk a bit about this, this holding environment? Yeah. One of my big influences, and, and this influence runs through all of my books, is from the a British pediatrician and child psychoanalyst named Donald Winnicott, or D.W. Winnicott. And Winnicott, he was practicing mostly in the 40s and the 50s in Britain. And he's the one who coined the phrase, the good enough mother, because in those days, it was always the mother taking care of the baby. Now we might say the good enough parent. The parent doesn't have to be perfect. The parent just has to be good enough. And he said the, the good enough parent doesn't uh, intrude or abandon, you know, in the face of what's difficult about their child. And he talked a lot about the, that that kind of parent creates a holding environment, not just physical holding, although it does include physical holding, but also a kind of emotional holding where no matter what's happening in the baby's emotional experience, because he talks about the baby anger and desire and need and love, it's not all separated out into separate emotions that a baby attacks the mother or the father ruthlessly. Ruthless was Winnicott's favorite word. And the, and the parent has to sort of handle that, you, you know, uh, and if they get too upset and abandoned or too upset and retaliate, then that creates a kind of psychic scarring in the, in the child. But the, the good enough parent is able to like, oh yeah, I know you're upset, but maybe we just need to change your diaper or look at that like cute little mobile over there or let me read you a story while I give you some food, you know? So that, that's the emotional holding and handling that, uh, that is naturally there. Winnicott always said, said that parents know this instinctively. You know, they don't have to be taught by experts. This is just what they do. I love that as a model, not just for, for having children, but also as a model for what happens in psychotherapy, which Winnicott also made that connection. He said that patients come to us with you know, the damage that uh, might have occurred in their, in their upbringing. And they look to us uh, in a similar way to hold their difficult emotions for them until 
they can be gradually digested or metabolized or made sense out of or have words put on them or from the Buddhist side, we would say until they can self-liberate. But I also saw that model as something that we do intrapsychically, you know, inside ourselves when we practice uh, many kinds of meditation, certainly like mindfulness, where we're, our minds, we're, there's, a, there's a singer named Jimmy Dale Gilmore who has a great song, uh, My Mind Has a Mind of Its Own. It takes me out to parties when I'd rather be alone. Yeah. You, you know, uh, our minds run on without us. That's, that was the idea between, behind uh, Thoughts Without a Thinker. So our minds are like the infant, you know, uh, but our mindfulness mind, you know, is like the good enough parent, the good enough mother. We're creating it with mindfulness a holding environment, you know, where whatever arises, the, the uncomfortable, the blissful, the painful, the shame, you know, the pain in the body, what, whatever it happens to be, whatever arises can become what we call an object of mindfulness, which just means that it can be held in the mind, you know, held with awareness. So I, so I think that I use that, that Winnicottian notion of the holding environment to link child rearing and psychotherapy and meditation. It has been very helpful in terms of thinking about what we do as therapists. Thank you. You mentioned uh, Donald Winnicott as one of your influences, and there, there's a few uh, key influences that run through this book. Uh, one of them is Ram Das. I was very yeah. interested in, in your references and stories about it. Can you tell a little bit about your experiences with Ram Das and how he influenced you? Sure. Well, you, you mentioned that Banyan Books has been around since 1970. Well, I discovered Buddhism in 1971 when I was a uh, freshman in college and I, and I met a girl who I liked who was taking an introduction to world religion class, which had never occurred to me to take an introduction to world religion class, but I followed her to the class. And uh, the first semester was all Eastern thought and the second semester was, was Western religion. And the, the text we read in Buddhism was the Dhammapada, which is a collection of verse, which is incredible. And the, and the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu, was the Hindu text. Anyway, a year or two later, as I was already like, oh, this is interesting to me and so on, a graduate student teaching fellow in a psychology class I was taking, whose name was, was Daniel Goleman, who went on to become the psychology writer for the New York Times and then wrote Emotional Intelligence. He was then a graduate student just back from India with like big, long, frizzy hair, purple bell-bottom pants. And, uh, and I was like, this guy knows something that, that, <laughs> that I'm going to get from him. So uh, I made friends with him and he said, oh yeah, if you want to know more about this, you should go out to this place in Colorado where all these friends of mine are teaching this summer a place called Naropa Institute, which was just beginning. And so I listened to him and went out there and Ram Dass was there. D Danny Goldman had already been in India with Ram Dass, knew Ram Dass. Uh, but so I, I went out there, I met uh, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Kornfield and Sharon Salzberg and Ram Dass. He had been, uh, I was at Harvard, he had been at Harvard 10 years before. He was long gone. He was Richard Alpert, professor of psychology, fired for giving psychedelics. You know, had already gone to India, changed his name, come back, big long beard, long hair, you know, but so, so funny and smart and a great storyteller. But my professor at Harvard was the guy, David McClellan, was the guy who had both hired Alpert and Timothy Leary and then had to fire them. But he stayed friends with Ramdas and he would let all the hippies who had been in India with Ram Dass, they, when they came through Cambridge, they would stay in David McClellan's house. So I started hanging out there. So I got to know Ram Dass on a more in, in a more intimate way when I was, you know, 21, 22, 23 years old with like hair down to here and so on. And I stayed, I stayed friends with him over the years, but, but I would see him after I went to medical school and so on, I would see him maybe every 10 or 20 years. I tell this story in the book, and it was one of the organizing stories for uh, how to talk about what, what am I bringing to being a therapist that might be different from what other people bring. And uh, so I tell this story of going to visit Ram Dass. He had a stroke in 1997. 
He was living in Tiburon, uh, Northern California, and it took away his voice. He could still talk a little bit, but he couldn't. He had an aphasia, which means he couldn't find words. His mind was fine, but he couldn't put it in words. So it was a huge blow. He was partially paralyzed. It was a bad stroke. I went to visit him about a year or two after the stroke, and he greeted me. And I know for him, I was always like 20 years old when he first met me. I was probably 45 at this point. And he greeted me and he's all teased me still. He never lost his sense of humor despite the stroke. Teased me, you know, oh, so are you a Buddhist psychiatrist now, Mark? A Buddhist psychiatrist now? <laughs> uh, and and uh, I was like, I guess, I, I guess you could call me that, you know? And then he got serious. And then it took him a really long time to get the sentence out, but he was like, so do you see them, meaning my patients, do you see them as already free, as already free? And I was like, what's he saying? I could, it took me, you know, do I see them as already free? Yes, in fact, like, yes, if people come in tangled in a tangle, upset about stuff, but that sense of everyone has Buddha nature underlying this current incarnation. Is it possible to hold that image of their Buddha nature and, and coax them towards that? I think Ramdas was putting words on what I hadn't yet put words on about what I maybe was at my best trying to do. And, and I talked about that in the book as like, not just being a psychotherapist, but also being a spiritual friend. And that maybe being spiritual friend to the people who come to see me has something to do with seeing them as already free. So I, I incorporated that into the book. And then I closed the book with a visit to Ramdas uh, the year before he died in Maui, where he was then living, swimming in the ocean with him and hanging out with him for a couple of days and feeling how he had really become the person he had always pretended to be and how, uh, what a wonderful thing it was to be around him, you know, in that he was, his body was suffering and his mind was totally free and, and full of love, really. So I tried to evoke that in my, in the last bit of the book, writing about what that was like to be with him. It's really wonderful to read and I recommend everybody to, to get this book and, and to go fully into those stories. I just want to remind our live audience that Dr. Epstein will be taking some of your questions uh, towards the last 15 minutes. So please, I see there's a couple already rolling in. Please go ahead and, and put your questions into the Q&A tab on Zoom and, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. You, you talked about uh, the impact that what Ram Das said to you uh, and I'm trying to find here, there's a quote from your friend who used to be your therapist where he talked mm. about the return to innocence. And I'm, I'm just scrambling for the quote here. Oh, here yeah. it is. Yeah. So Michael Vincent Miller, you tell the story of your friend and former therapist. He's describing what makes Buddhism and therapy similar. And he says, they both aim for the restoration of innocence after experience. They both aim for the restoration of innocence after experience. It's such a moving statement. I'm wondering Isn't if you it? can unpack that a bit for sure. us. Sure. It's so nice that you picked that out also. My, uh, my editor loved that. She, she was like, oh, you know, when I read this through, that was one of the things that really, really struck me, you know, because we're used to thinking about experience as everything. You know, we're supposed to learn from experience. We get wiser from experience. But... Michael Vincent Miller, who was my therapist for many years and uh, then did become my friend and also became very interested in, in Buddhist practice himself. And he's, he's still around. He said this to me, we were, we were having dinner together and I was uh, telling him about a couple of the patient sessions in the book, two of which had to do with early sexual trauma. Both these patients, uh, when they were teenagers, had been molested. And, uh, and Michael rather spontaneously said, oh, you know, that's one of the things that I think really links uh, these two traditions is the, the return or the restoration of innocence after experience. Because one of the things that happens with sexual molestation, for instance, is that it, it takes the, um, the, the innocence of one's sexuality away. 
like when, when it's imposed on, on a person like that, it, it's like they, then they're, they're not discovering their own body, their own arousal, their own, their own erotic selves naturally, you know, like with someone they want to be with. It's, a, it's like in, inserted or imposed. So that's, you know, experience, too much experience. So, uh, but I think not just in cases of sexual trauma, but, you know, life itself, you, no matter how blessed one's life is, it's still traumatic. But this idea of what was your face before you were born, you know, which is a famous Zen koan, the, the, which I think connotes the innocence before experience and that that's still latent inside of us. And that when we create this holding environment, when we let everything that, that settle down, well, another thing Ram Dass always said to me was, you're not who you think you are. So when we let who we think we are settle down, that, that, that sense of innocence is, it, it wants to reemerge. And I, and I think Michael put it in the way Ram Dass said, did you see them as already free? Michael encapsulated it so beautifully, you know, words that I could not have thought of myself. So I got a little scared when my editor liked it so much because I know Michael is writing about it also. So I had to get his permission the same way I had to get permission from all my patients to include their stuff. I had to get his permission to include that. And luckily he said, fine. You know, It's, it's such an intimate experience to read about your sessions with your patients and then also to, to read your, your reflections after. It's really a, an inside look. And I was excited seeing you on video because after reading the book, I'm like, oh, this is the office where this, you know, these, these uh, sessions were happening. One of the things that really struck me, and you refer to it a couple of times, is there's a certain spontaneity that you allow in your sessions where you allow yourself to be surprised. I'm wondering how, how much your meditation practice has influenced that. And how important that sort of open spontaneity is in working with your patients? I think my meditation practice has really encouraged that aspect of my being. I, I think my general tendency pre-meditation and, and even a lot post-meditation would be um, you to be worrying, to be anxious, to be like trying to trying to do a good job, you, you know, but tight. And meditation, one of the first, even before I got real meditation instruction, I think I told this story in an early book, my, my roommates at Naropa taught me how to juggle. They were like fruit, came from a family that sold fruits and vegetables in Long Beach, Long Island. And, and instead of going to class at Naropa, they would go to the fruit and vegetable market in Denver and come, for, they filled our apartment with like crates of oranges and whatnot. And, and one of them, one of the twins, who I was living with, taught me how to juggle. And uh, it was, I think that sense of juggling where everything's floating, you know, where everything's, you can't hold, if you, if you hold on too tight, you know, the, everything falls to the ground. So I, I think meditation served that function for me also, you know, just free, got my too, too tight mind to relax enough that it could surprise itself that things would come out of me that I wasn't expecting, you know? So humor, for instance, or I don't know what else, but you know, certain things. So to take that into the practice of psychotherapy, I was very much, I came in like the idea of the analyst or the therapist as like the blank screen or the all-knowing patriarchal figure who's gonna heal you with interpretations. I didn't believe in that. And I didn't really want that. I was looking for someone who could be real with me, you know, and tell me what he, what he or she thought, because I needed help and I needed to be more real. So in order for me to be more, more authentically myself, because I didn't know what, who myself was or what myself was, I needed someone to mirror that for me, you know? So I see psychotherapy as more of a creative act where two people are in the room together with no idea of what they're going to do together or what really what they're going to talk about or what's going to happen and that so that it's open from the beginning and then full of surprises and and that's what that's what has kept it exciting you know and and interesting because people come for therapy sometimes thinking they know why they're coming sometimes not 
but usually what they start with isn't where isn't where they go. So uh, the the whole thing becomes a surprise, which, which is very exciting. One one thing I find really fascinating is so we have in in therapy it seems that a lot of the work is centered around repairing wounding to our perception of self, forming a healthy whole ego, and then the Buddhist element is often completely deconstructing our sense of self. How do you see those two converging skillfully? Uh, going back to Winnicott for a moment. Winnicott was very lucid, very persuasive in talking about how many of us create what he called a false self or a caretaker self designed to manage the intrusive or abandoning environment, emotional environment, sometimes family, sometimes school, sometimes church, some, you know, whatever culture, but a false or caretaker self designed to manage the intrusive or abandoning environment in which we find ourselves. Because we come in to this incarnation, we come in, you know, like here I am, I'm like in this body and I'm this person and, you know, like, ah, what am I, how am I, how am I supposed to cope? So the coping, which is an ego function, we have to construct ourselves somehow, you know, in order to negotiate this life and all these people around us, even in COVID, you know, uh, the family that we're born into and the school and our sexuality and so on. Self becomes to some degree a construction. And to, and to some degree, unreal. To many degrees, it's very necessary. So that so the self is a necessary construction. We, we need it to get along. If we're just like tripping all the, you know, just like totally open, it, it, it doesn't work. But from the psychoanalytic or psychodynamic side, they would talk about that as the, the defensive organization of the personality. We create defenses. The ego creates defenses in order to get along. So I think that that's all saying the same thing, the false self, the caretaker self, the constructed defensive organization of the person. But all of that, you know, when Ram Dass says, you're not who you think you are, in a very pithy way, that's what he's saying the same thing. With the innocence before experience, that's that, or innocence after experience, that's saying the same thing. We, we construct these selves, we need them, but, but we pay a price because we lose touch with our innocence, our truer nature, certainly our Buddha nature, like what is that and how do I get there? So the, the role, I think, of both the spiritual teacher, meditation teacher, or the spiritually inclined psychotherapist, or maybe even the non-spiritually inclined psychotherapist, the, the role is to gently try to poke fun at or untangle or bring awareness would be another way of saying bring awareness to those defenses that have been constructed unconsciously that maybe served a function at one point uh, but we don't need them anymore but we're still doing them in, you know, like in a sort of obsessive compulsive way. We're still like throwing the ball at the wall or counting or touching the doorknob before we leave the room. Do we really need to do that anymore? Or just worrying or counting, measuring ourselves all the time. You know, there's gradations of this, but the, the, the liberation that comes from therapy or from meditation, the freedom that comes is when, oh, you can put that, a lot of those burdens down. I don't really need this false self so much anymore. I can rely on my spontaneity, on my improvisational nature, on my creative self. I can rest in that as much as in the, all the rituals that I've created to, that tell me who I am. Thank you. We have some really great questions rolling in from our live audience. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get to a couple of those right now, if that's all right with you. That's good. There's one from Lindsay who says, hello, Dr. Epstein. I'm a philosophy student at SFU and recently wrote a paper in response to the trauma of everyday life. I came 
came across a journal article recently that argued that psychiatry practices, CBT, DBT, ACT, etc., that integrate Buddhism into their clinical approaches, unfairly center Buddhist mindfulness over comparable practices from other religious traditions. And more problematically, there exists an ongoing, unacknowledged appeal to religious norms of Buddhism that are anti-ethical to medicine as a science. What would you say to a criticism like this, please? Antithetical. Antithetical. Well, I don't think it's an yeah, sorry, yeah, antithetical. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Lindsay, I would say. The founder of dialectical behavioral therapy which is one of the cognitive strategies, you know, that has proven very effective in dealing with a lot of post-traumatic stuff. The founder of dialectical behavioral therapy was a woman named Marcia, uh, uh, Marsha Linehan, who's out on the way in Seattle. I think she was at University of Washington. And uh, she was a behaviorist by training and, uh, but had the, uh, uh, the, I think, brilliant insight that many of uh, the young, so-called borderline, suicidal, anorectic kinds of patients that one would see on an inpatient unit in a psychiatric hospital, who the staff was seeing as you know, overly emotional and acting out and cutting themselves and whatever, that they were actually phobic toward their own emotions. So that the emotional an emotion would start to arise in the body and they would have an aversive reaction and run away from it. And that a lot of the, what looked like uh, emotional distress was actually the fear or the phobic response to what was happening inside of them. And Marsha Linehan, it, turn, it turned out, was also had a Zen practice herself. And so uh, she took her behaviorist training and her Zen practice and brought it together in what became known as DBT, uh, first by making like flashcards that had uh, the names of the emotions written on them, like mad, sad, glad. And she would teach the patients, this is what you're feeling. This is what being angry is. This is what being sad is. And so there was a kind of a creation of that holding environment that we talked about before, where emotions could not only be felt, but they could also be named. And, and that was super important and super helpful. People in the mindfulness world, I think, started to see all these connections that, oh, this is, there, this is a kind of my application of mindfulness. And I think that Lindsay is probably right in that there's a, there was a big push of Buddhist, especially mindfulness-based ideology that has come into these various treatments of trauma because they took the ball and ran with it. And it, there, it may well be that in many other of the religious traditions of the world that have a contemplative aspect to them, that there would be ways of teasing out and integrating some of what is, has proven beneficial in cultures that never heard of Buddhism, that never heard of mindfulness, but still were using these spiritual traditions to help people with their traumatic experiences, rather than creating more traumatic experiences for their practitioners, but under the umbrella of their religious traditions. So that, all, that could still all be unfolding. And in Buddhism, they say one of the last one of the last fetters, meaning one of the last chains that hold, that hold, that keep back the enlightened mind from fully flourishing, one of the last fetters is conceit. And conceit is, uh, is talked about as the measuring of oneself against another. So I think there are many people in the Buddhist world who are quite conceited about what Buddhism has and are uh, measuring that against the other religious traditions. And that's of no help to anybody. So, so maybe Lindsay is sort of hinting at that. Thank you. And thank you, Lindsay, for your question. This one is from Ebra, who says, I feel that people who have drug addiction and mental illness challenges are quote unquote, left out of these healing processes, especially if one suffers from a mental illness like psychophrenia. My daughter had both challenges and passed away last summer from an overdose. I managed through counseling and meditation, but my daughter couldn't benefit from this. It's frustrating. Can you address this topic? 
I think she, I think maybe the, uh, the daughter had schizophrenia. Is it possible? Yeah, that's what I wondered too. It's written as yeah, psych. It's written, yeah. Anyway, it doesn't, but anyway, severe mental illness and addiction. What I found, this is just speaking very personally as a psychiatrist who from, for a number of years during my training and after my training, I worked in, in, in a psychiatric hospital on closed or locked units that treated severe mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar or manic depressive illness, mostly manifesting in young people having their first psychotic breaks, or, or people suffering from anorexia, panic attacks, d- deep and dark depression, and or addiction, which can happen in concert with, with all of those conditions. And what, what I found is that uh, when people are severely mentally and emotionally troubled, when they're thought disordered, when they can't think straight, they can't practice meditation the way it's conventionally taught. But they can really benefit from a, an, a, a, um, a version of it that's adapted for them. So, for instance, with a a, a paranoid, a young, young paranoid schizophrenic a young man, I found that if I sat across from him and tried to, you know, be his doctor, that he would get more paranoid and, you know, like, what are you, you're reading my mind and you're trying to poison me and stuff. But that if I sat side by side with him and we both looked at the wall together and I could just listen to him, because there's, there's a lot of intelligence, in, even in very psychotic people, if I could listen to him while not making him uncomfortable and kind of riff off of what he was saying and try to get to the, the, the underlying symbolic meaning of, the, of, of, the, of his language, which I think is what someone like R.D. Lang was always trying to do. It didn't cure anybody, but it... it allowed a therapeutic connection to build that 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 was one way that I saw oh yeah I'm really I'm trying to tap what I know from meditation and use in this environment I think with the addictions you know the whole 12-step world I mean that's a spiritual community if there ever was one and there's there's so much spiritual wisdom that's completely congruous with what I've learned from Buddhism in the 12 step world. So I think it's already being applied there. Thank you. Thank you, Abra, for that question. There's one from Chris here. I think this is a good one. And you do get into this in the book. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Chris says, in meditation, we are to let go and have no attachment. But in therapy, we are to bring up the dark thoughts or experiences. How do you deal with that as a therapist? Well, first of all, I would say in both therapy and meditation, the dark thoughts and experiences come up. They come up naturally, because if they, if they haven't been digested, if they haven't been metabolized, if they're lurking within, in our unconscious or in, you know, in, our, in our minds, our hearts, our bodies, however you want to imagine it, they come up. So that's something to understand about meditation. And sometimes people feel they're doing it wrong in meditation if if that stuff comes up but i would say no that's exactly right what you learn in in either field is not to prematurely turn away from whatever it is that you're thinking or feeling or remembering the buddha when he taught his four noble truths which is really where he outlined the essence of his psychology his first noble truth, you know, he just, he said one word, he said dukkha. And dukkha is usually translated as suffering, which I think is maybe not the best uh, word, the, the best translation, because then people get a negative view of Buddhism, like Buddha's just saying everything's suffering, and what about love, and what about happiness? But he's not, he wasn't saying love and happiness don't exist at all. He was saying that the, our, our world is tinged with a sense of unsatisfactoriness because even the love and happiness doesn't last forever and people get sick and they die and they get separated. And so, and we know that 
so that 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 knowledge is lurking so that the the dukkha word if you actually look at the word and take the word apart it means hard to face cause face and so there's sukha which is like pleasing to face sweet to face you know joy dukkha which is hard to face so the the, the buddha he didn't have our kind of psychological language but but he was saying something you know incredibly profound which is that our instinctive tendency is to turn away from that which is difficult but that that perpetuates our suffering so and that the whole four noble truths the whole eightfold path the whole outline of meditation and what it's for is to teach us how to not turn away how to be with the entirety of our human experience the difficult and the wonderful and to see it to see it all as part and parcel of what this life is about and to learn to be with it not pushing away the unpleasant not clinging to the pleasant but creating a holding environment or a field you know where where everything can arise and and the buddha claims will liberate itself if you learn how to relate to it in a particular non-attached way non-attached doesn't mean that we don't get attached in a western psychological way to our parents our children the people we love that kind of attachment the the buddha was not saying is is wrong the buddha was saying with that kind of attachment comes this underlying need to recognize that nothing is permanent that that nothing gives lasting satisfaction that we all have to take care of our own minds and hearts because of that truth Thank you. There's an interesting question from Randolph uh, who says Dr. Epstein mentions that his therapist later became his friend. Is that something that often happens? Would he care to comment further for example age difference etc. Does he recommend this for other therapists? It does sometimes happen. And uh, I think in many in many worlds of psychotherapy or worlds of psychotherapists uh, or worlds of psychoanalysts it's been frowned upon because the uh, the psychoanalysis or the psychotherapy was seen as needing to exist almost in its own bubble in its own world for it to be uh, most effective and i think for many people that remains true and that if a if a therapist is too needy for the friendship of his or her patients obviously that's a problem and if a patient or client wants to be friends instead of doing the work that's necessary to be in therapy then that's a problem so the whole thing is fraught can we be friends with 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 our therapist but sometimes and in fact i think often the nature of the therapy is one of friendship and and i use that in in this book you know in in this book i'm taking a real chance because i'm trying to show what i'm really doing as a therapist i think i was partially motivated by the idea of a, i'm in my 60s already and i'm going to be dead soon and no one's ever going to know what it was that i've been doing so at least at least there's this record you know it's a kind of anti buddhist attempt to stop time but i also wanted to show that the this sense of friendship that can grow in the psychotherapy relationship is real it's real in itself and sometimes it just naturally turns into a friendship like the therapy part either is done and and then we can just be friends or what my uh, i had two therapists michael vincent miller who we mentioned before and then when i moved away from boston where he had been to new york i went to see michael vincent miller's therapist who had become his friend i, I and his name was isidor from i went to see him and uh, isidor said to me when you're in the room with me i'm your therapist 
if you see me in the store or on the street or if we're at a party together or something, I'm not your therapist, I'm gonna be your friend. And that that when, so he was friends with a lot of people that he saw, he was a training, he was a Gestalt therapist who trained many Gestalt therapists. So it, even in the psychoanalytic circles, you'll find people are in training analyses with uh, so-and-so, but then they're in the psychoanalytic society with their analyst. So they're all interacting on many levels. So even in those most, most orthodox worlds, the thing interbeing, speaking of Thich Nhat Hanh, things overlap. And it's up to us to try to parse that, to work that out ethically. And, you know, many, many, many opportunities for those ethics to be breached, but not impossible to work it out ethically to the ben for the benefit of all. Thank you. And, and thanks to our live audience for all of your wonderful qu questions. It's so great to have you all here with us. Big thanks to Jacob Steele, our podcast producer and the events curator for Banyan Books for all the work he does. He's here behind the scenes handling things and he does so much for Banyan. And uh, before we close, I wanted to finish. We kind of naturally came to this topic of therapist as spiritual friend. And it reminded me of, you talk about the story of the Buddha's conversation with Ananda, where he says, the Buddha says to Ananda, admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie is actually the whole of the holy life. How have you seen this unfold in your work with therapy patients? The first part of that quote is Ananda, who's always asking the Buddha, a question, and then the Buddha is always like, "Oh no, Ananda, you're getting it all wrong." And then, and then the Buddha clarifies it. So the first part is the uh, Ananda says, "Friendship, camaraderie is actually half of the holy of the holy life, isn't it? Isn't it, uh, Lord? Isn't it, Buddha?" And the Buddha says, "No, no, Ananda, it's not half. It's the whole of the holy life." I like to think of me of uh, therapy as as an interpersonal meditation, you know, a two person meditation. We're so used to thinking of meditation as something that we do intrapersonally, intrapsychically. So once we bring it into the open, into the, you know, into the office, into the therapeutic feel, then you start to feel really, oh, meditation is friendship. Friendship is meditation. What are we doing even when we're meditating with our own minds? Aren't we just making friends with our own minds? Uh, even with those dark parts that we want to look away from. So I, I like to use this phrase, the, the point of it all is to become partners with the capacities that constitute us. And, and uh, if, if, what you, if we think about that in terms of friendship and, and society and so on, if we really all, if we're not just one thing in ourselves, but, but if we're all here together, than to become partners with the capacities that constitute us would, to be, would be to become friends with all beings, if that were only possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark Epstein, for, for being here on Banyan Books in conversation today. It's really wonderful to have you. Such a pleasure. Thanks for orchestrating this. It's been fun for me.